Uh, hi, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us at Secular AZ. Uh, if you are joining us today, uh, please feel free to put your name in the chat if you're here in the webinar or on our Facebook page. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state now for over a decade. Uh, we have incredible programming, including this this right here, our Friday updates from all kinds of amazing speakers. Uh, we we talk to historians, authors, journalists, elected officials, you name it, and they come by and talk to us. Next Friday, we're actually going to be speaking with special guests Lily Rasmussen and Paula Sophia Schonauer. She's going to tell me how to pronounce that next week <laughs> for a discussion of how trans discrimination contributes to economic and housing insecurity. And we will continue to talk about our unhoused neighbors and how we can help folks experiencing homelessness for the next few weeks. At this, at a, all this at a time where we are now at 21 consecutive days over 110 degrees. And while we always need your financial support to do the work that we do, I'd like to also encourage you to support some great local secular groups who are working to combat homelessness in Arizona. Um, I also want to share, and I don't know, Lindsay's probably on top of it right now, but we have put together a really great shared secular calendar for all things happening in the state of Arizona uh, that have anything to do with uh, agnosticism, atheism, secular humanism, or just, you know, like being a decent person without the threat of some angry God in the sky wanting to, you know, condemn you to hell or whatever. So um, hopefully you can take a look there and see the different programming that we have. It's pretty great. Uh, and it's color coded as Lindsay's putting it up there right now. So um, it's pretty cool because we have, you know, there was a, there was a discussion on one of the secular pages, uh, the Arizona atheist page on Facebook. And this guy was like, I'm up here and wherever he was, Cottonwood or Sedona. I was like, I can't find anybody. So after that, we had a discussion. We're like, well, Hey, Look at, there's all kinds of stuff going on. There's social stuff, there's community action work, there's educational stuff like this, and then there's activism stuff. So we wanted to just make sure that we were able to, you know, share all the good deeds that us atheists, uh, agnostics, and humanists are doing all over the state of Arizona. But today, we're going to put that on the shelf because today... We are joined by somebody from one in 10. Carrie Kramer was recently promoted to Pond. And you're going to have to explain what that means in just a second. Absolutely. <laughs> Program manager at one in 10. Carrie's pronouns are she, they. Uh, Carrie is responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operation, implementation, and success of one in 10's Pond housing and workforce programs, including evaluating programs, ensuring best practice, and supporting program expansion. Pond Housing is a supportive rapid rehousing program designed to provide short-term housing solutions for LGBTQ plus and allied youth experiencing homelessness. So far, Carrie has housed 21 youth in the year 2023 and anticipates moving nine more in by the end of the year. That is like, I'm almost a little verklempt about it because like, I just watched this horrible clip on YouTube of Chino Valley, California and the folks in the audience like celebrating this decision, this policy decision to forcibly like out LGBTQ students to reject their, hor uh, their pronouns, um, to reject their, you know, nicknames and to dead name them. And so I'm just so grateful for organizations like One in Ten. And and actually, there was one time I got to tell you this story. There was one time I was at a bar with a friend of mine, uh, and we were sitting around talking. And I was uh, I overheard them talking about One in Ten. And they were like people like in their twenties. And so I had to go over them because I just talked to Nate Roten from One in Ten. And I was like, oh my gosh. And they were like, oh, you just talked to Nate. Make sure you tell him he said hi. And like, and then and the next time I saw him. He totally know who knew who all those young people. Of course, <laughs> it's a great organization. So, if there's anything that I missed in your bio or anything, and please define Pond for us. But it's just such a great organization that does really good work, and especially at a time where our our LGBTQ youth are just increasingly under attack. So, thank you for the work that you do, Carrie. Of course, of course, I'm definitely going to dive right in here, and I'm going to give you all a nice run through of what one in ten is for those that don't know it. Um, just to give you a quick definition, PUN stands for Promise of a New Day. So we definitely want to promise these youth a new day to wake up in a home. Um, let's go ahead and get started.
right. Can we all see this? Okay. Yes. yes, you can see it. Yes, you're good. Perfect. So we have one in 10. Today's youth, tomorrow's future. All right. So one in 10 was founded in 1993. And of course, in 1993, uh, one in 10 children had come out as queer. So that is where one in 10 gets their name. Uh, one in 10 children coming out as queer. Um, our vision here at one in 10 is we envision a world where LGBTQ plus youth and young adults are embraced for who they are, actively engaged in their communities and empowered to lead. Our mission statement is our mission is to serve LGBTQ plus youth and young adults ages 11 to 24. We enhance their lives by providing empowering social and service programs that promote self-expression, self-acceptance, leadership development, and healthy life choices. Now I'm gonna dive into what one in 10 offers and these are our programs. Down here at our youth center located in Phoenix, Arizona, we are in the Parson Center for Health and Wellness. We operate Monday through Friday in our youth center from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Programs usually start promptly at 5 p.m. We not only provide hot meals and snacks for all our youth that come in, we also offer a shower for those that are experiencing homelessness that need to come in, get a fresh change of clothes from our gender affirming closet, get any hygiene products such as toiletries, shampoo, conditioner, uh, soap. Um, we also have community resources because we are in the Parsons Center um, for those that might need therapy or other organizations. Um, we have engaging youth programs. We have a full music room, a gaming station, and then twice a month, we have a med van that comes here from Phoenix Children's Hospital that sets up outside. And they are here um, two times out of the month. And then the last Thursday of the month, we have our dental van. So for those individuals that need either medical or dental attention, we have that here for them as well. Uh, just as you all know, last week, we kicked off our first session of Camp Outdoors. I had the privilege of being there this last week. It was amazing. Uh, we have Camp Outdoors, we do it twice a year. Uh, we also have our trans and non-binary retreat. We have our Together in Color retreat. And this is just an opportunity for our LGBTQ plus youth to find empowerment in a safe and fun outdoor in our summer and fall in a camp environment. We learn everything from LGBTQ plus history, nonviolent communication. We do a drum circle, variety show. There's an archery, there's zip lining, and a whole bunch of other activities we do. And let me tell you, it is a blast. These youth, by the time it's time to go home, don't want to go home. So it's nice to have a nice space for them to be able to, you know, spend some time with other youth that may identify as themselves and just have a great time. Um, here's some more photos for you to see all these smiling young faces. All right, so now we're going to dive into what the reasoning we're here for. So as you know, Arizona has fewer shelter beds for our homeless youth than they've had in many years. Um, at this time, the only two homeless shelters that I know of are Home Base and Phoenix 350. And if you're not familiar with those are, those are um, sh homeless shelters dedicated just for youth here in Phoenix. Um, there is home base is located on Ninth Street in Devonshire. And then they have a second location that is located in Surprise. Um, the Lincoln YMCA just opened a youth shelter about a couple months ago. They have changed their Lincoln Center to their middle floor being their youth center where they will accept youth, uh, I believe it's 18 to 26 experiencing homelessness, and they have rooms for male, female, and non-binary individuals. Um, youth that have been, youth then that has more than years, uh, more young people become homelessness, higher rates of sex and labor trafficking among homeless youth. Um, as you can see, sex trafficking is a major uh, problem we have here in the state of Arizona. Um, it's even worse for those experiencing homelessness, those that are uh, that are 18 to 25, especially those that are LGBTQ youth are more likely to be exploded. And it is just something that we need to be mindful of to get these young individuals off the street and into a home. 
Um, Gina Reed, who is our program manager and our parents group, group facilitator here at one in 10, has actually seen a decrease in parents kicking their kids out because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Instead, they push them out for not accepting them and making their home environment inhospitable. LGBTQ youth still experience higher rates of harassment at school. Um, they figure it's better off on my own, and unfortunately, that is not the case. A lot of them don't have life skills set up for themselves, and they need to uh, find a way to get back on their feet. Uh, youth are uh, especially appealing to predators because these young adults often don't have support system and a crave of sense of belonging, making them easy as targeted to be manipulated because they have come from a background where they haven't experienced self-love, they haven't experienced a loving family. Um, so that is where we step in to kind of help. Um, this is our program. Sorry, it's called- Sorry, can I ask you real quick? I'm yes. sorry. Just go back to that last slide for one second, just because like, you know, I'm seeing these arguments right now, right, about these various laws uh, that are being passed or policies that are being adopted by school boards about like, well, this just this just lets the parents know. And of course, the parents are going to be like accepting and loving, but the parents need to know because it's their right to know. And it's like, like what you're saying to me right now is that actually it seems like acceptance is declining. Is that correct? It, yes and no. Um, a lot of support has been out there. We have a lot of parents that are very excited that we have this space for their youth to come to, to meet other individuals. And we also have support for them to be able to talk to other parents that may be struggling with accepting their child as well. Uh, we had the pleasure of having um, our governor come in a few weeks ago and signed some laws that make sure that we're not going to have um, some things that are going to impact as far as uh, making sure that our youth are safe. Um, but yeah, it it it's hard to say because not everyone comes forward that says they're accepting. But as far as what we can see, it's there has been a decrease. Um, but that doesn't say that there may be an increase. I can say at least 75% of my youth that are in our PON program right now, so out of those 21, 75% of them did come to the one in 10 doors with suitcases in hand because their parents had kicked them out. Hmm, that's tragic. Um, real quick, there's a question in the chat. Mary is asking, does one in 10 have a Tucson service place? And I'm sure this is part of your presentation, but that is a question going forward and I'll let you get back to so, it. I can just quickly answer that. We are um, on the amends of making a Tucson location, but unfortunately we're running into a problem because there is another organization that is in Tucson as well. So we're not trying to stop in anyone's toes. Um, and we'll go on to Promise a New Day housing program. So essentially what it is, is we offer single occupancy for housing for ages 18 to 24. We give them one-on-one -on -one wraparound services with case management support um, as far as referrals and resources. Um, we are not behavioral health, so it's more of a light touch. Um, we will recommend a youth to get more services through a therapist if that is something they would like. Um, we do employment education coaching with our workforce. Um, we are driven navigations to meet them where they're at. Uh, we will give them mental health resources and connections to mental health services and SMI evaluations, just because in our rapid rehousing program, like I said, it is set up for light touch support. And we wanna make sure that those youth that need additional support go to the correct programs. So if an individual struggles with um, substance abuse or has an SMI evaluation and they do get an SMI diagnosed, they can go what's called permanent housing solutions, which will then set the youth up for success for longer than a year. And if you need more information on that, I can provide you that as well. Um, we would like to be an internet connect, an in, intermediate connection to shelters and bed, um, especially those that come in to our center during our open times to make sure that they have a safe space to go to at night. Um, so that way they're not on the street. Um, homelessness is on the rise across Arizona, including the number of teens who are living on the streets or in a shelter. 
According to a new report by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Arizona tops the list for states with the largest increase of homeless youth. The numbers shown nearly 45% increase in Arizona compared to 2020. This is more of a definition as far as what our housing entails. Um, we are a rapid rehousing program that provides quick housing solutions for LGBTQIA plus and allied youth 18 to 24 who are literally homeless, unstably housed, are fleeing a dangerous situation. With temporary navigation and supportive services, participants are supported in addressing their challenges in a safe space where growth, self-esteem, strengths are celebrated and nurtured on a journey to maintaining permanent housing stability. One in 10 adopted this innovation approach by the rapid rehousing by utilizing a progressive engagement model that provides flexible amount of just enough assistance, taking youth's lead in determining what they need to gain housing stability. So what we like to tell our youth is they are in the driver's seat, we are in the passenger seat, and we are just navigating them through their trials and tribus of life. This often leads to an increase of uh, capacity to moving more youth experiencing homelessness and housing instability into a safe, stable, and permanent housing. With the PON, rapid rehousing supports youth utilizing three primary support strategies, housing identification, supportive service, and financial assistance. So we work with our youth to make sure that we are finding the appropriate place for them to live, making sure that they have services set up for their success, and then working with them on a budget so that way they know how to budget as far as paying rent, utilities, and other services they might have. Uh, we also provide a strength-based and trauma-informed care approach, drawing from youth's own life lived experiencing, navigation services to meet the youth where they are and provide youth-driven care. We also provide support to youth to drive their own housing solutions with our housing navigators, providing encouragement and support along the way. Go ahead. So uh, there's a couple of questions here. Um, let's see. I'm going to take this one first uh, from Rivco. Rivco, who is just an Arizona treasure. If you don't know who Rivco is, well, then you don't, then you've not lived. Um, she asks, as your group only serves 18 to 26 year olds, but it says here on 18 to 24 year olds, whatever it is, what is available for youth under the age of 18? So a youth under the age of 18 for us would be considered a mandated report because a youth is underage. Um, so we would have to get a DCS case involved with that. Now, we do have places that we utilize for those that are under 18, such as crisis, uh, Arizona Crisis of America. Um, we also partner up with UMOM. And those are two places that we know that are safe enough for our LGBTQ youth to go to if they're under the age of 18. Okay, and then um, the other question here, well, there's a couple of questions. So the, let's see, the, the one that came first, this one is from John. To what extent does social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, contribute to the harassment of our LGBTQ youth? As far as the harassment goes? Well, we ourselves have our own social media platform. Uh, we have our one in 10 Instagram. We have our one in 10 Facebook. Um, unfortunately, we, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but we have withdrawn recently from Twitter just because of all the issues that are going on with Twitter. So yeah. we make sure that we are supporting our youth, making sure that they are heard and just making sure that we post things on our social media to let them know that they are being heard. Um, it is unfortunate for those that do harass us. It does come with, you know, working in this organization, you're going to have those individuals that are not going to understand where we're coming from, but it's just letting those youth know that, you know, we hear them. We we see them and we are still here for them. Mm -hmm. um, here's another, this one comes from Mary. Uh, that's a huge increase in this age group for homelessness. I believe I saw, what was it? 45%. Um, what was the Arizona and perhaps the Phoenix, I, I think she means area population increase since 2020. Is that a correlation or is it something else? It's a little bit of both. It's COVID. COVID was a huge, huge, huge impact on those that are, were trying to stay out of shelter situations. Um, it was also, we're seeing more individuals that are feeling more confident in themselves to come out and be their authentic selves. And not everyone has those parents that might be accepting 
and they just want to be able to still live their lives as themselves. So that is why you see an increase. Right. Um, and then, and I'm sure you're probably going to get into this because already people are asking how they can donate. So <laughs> yes, so, yes. <laughs> Sandra is asking, do you accept individual package stacks as a donation, any other items? And I'm sure you're probably going to get to that. So if you want to continue or if you want to absolutely. Ask that, so I can ahead. tell you right now on our one in 10 website, we do uh, have a wish list for our next 10 individuals that are be entering the pond program. Um, we do furnish their homes um, and you will see here in a minute how that entails and how we get those things. But yes, if you would like to donate, there is a link on our Facebook page. There is a link on our Instagram page. Um, yes, 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 I'm all sure around. That, I'm sure that Lindsay is probably <laughs> furiously working behind the scenes to get those links up. So. <laughs> and I can post them too in, in the <laughs> chat when I'm done. Awesome, thank you. No problem. All right, so here I'm gonna dive in with more of our partnerships with Pond because we're not just one people, we have a whole group of people that are behind us. Uh, first we do is we identify where the youth is gonna be the safest with living. Um, we wanna make sure that we believe every youth should have access to a safe and affordable living environment where they can be their true selves. We are currently working with two main partners to place youth in our housing. So we partner up with Native American Connections, NAC, if you've heard of it before. We currently have four units at Saguaro Key that we rent out ourselves that we will house a youth in if they meet the requirements for their program. So their requirements for their program are fun, federally funded traditional program specifically guidelines that if you have a job for a minimum of two months when you come into our housing program, you will have the opportunity to then rent out of Native American connections. Now, this is more of a short term goal for youth that are just trying to quick get on their feet because we can do a six month lease for them and then get them into um, a normal apartment that they can renew yearly after that. Um, this is a nice way for them to go into a furnished studio apartment um, have a place where they're going to have 24 hour care, they have case management on side, um, and they also are connected to home base, which is the shelter that's on the other side. Um, we also contract with Home Inc, who is a third party. Um, we work with them to work with any apartment in the Maricopa County that is going to work with our program. Um, they make specific rent payments based on where they're at. Um, how we do it is their first month and their second month are going to be completely paid by one in 10. We're going to pay in their move-in cost. That includes their security deposit. That includes their application. That includes any deposits that they need to do. And we're going to furnish their apartment as well. We would like our youth by their third month in the program to be at least 30% of paying their rent um, so that way they can have an idea of like how to pay for that rent, how to go through the portal, um, making sure that they're paying on time, not obtaining those late fees. By their six month, we want them to be at 60% of their rent. Um, and that is making sure that they're again, paying on time, making sure that they know how to submit the rent. So that way by their ninth month, they're at 100% of their rent because our program is six to 12 months, we wanna make sure that the youth is set up for success. So when their 12 months is up, they have the opportunity to either renew the lease where they're at because the lease is in their name and they are working directly with the apartment. Uh, they have an opportunity to keep their deposit if they keep their house or apartment up, up to par. Um, and they also have the opportunity to um, move somewhere else and get a roommate or whatever they would like to do, but yes. In the beginning, they're single occupancy, but again, we're setting this youth up for success to make sure that they can successfully live in an apartment for 12 months. Um, here is a quick sneak peek of what Saguaro Key will look like. As you can see, they do furnish the apartment with a twin size bed. Um, they provide the youth with a couch. Um, they provide the youth with a countertop with two chairs. Um, they do have a move-in kit as well. Um, they, for those that want to be more familiar with Swarrow Key and be more a part of their program itself, 
Um, like I said, they're adjacent to home base. They offer 24 furnished studio apartments. Utilities are included. The residents there will have access to on-site laundry, barbecues, community room. Um, Saguaro Key is for young adults, ages 18 to 24. Now, I did hear in surprise, they do go to age 26, but I don't want to confuse y'all because our housing program is 18 to 24, but Saguaro Key does go to 26. Um, we do have the four units out of the 24 units are there. Um, and if you need any information how to get into Saguaro Key, I have no problem sending that to you. Again, the minimum a youth has to be working is two months. So as long as the youth has worked for two months, they would definitely qualify to live on campus at Saguaro Key. Uh, we also work with Home Inc. Home Inc. is um, our third partner we work with. They work with Pad Missions, which is basically a Zillow for youth to look at apartments that are available and that are willing to work with this partnership. I was speaking to Lindsay earlier, and it doesn't have to be an apartment off pad missions. It can honestly be any apartment that is willing to work with our program and just letting them know that this is what our program is. It is not a voucher program because a lot of partners like to steer away from voucher programs, but just letting them know that, yes, this is a contract between the youth and the apartment complex. We're just the added support. So what we do is we meet our youth, we do our paperwork, um, Home Inc. has to do an inspection of the apartment before the youth can move in just to make sure that the apartment is up to par. We want to make sure that the windows are working. We want to make sure that the um, AC is working. We want to make sure the electricals are working, like making sure that everything is set up for success and a youth cannot move in until that inspection passes once the move, youth moves in. We uh, discuss as far as what their payment is going to be each month. Um, supporting them and then making sure that they're set up for success before they either move out or stay where they're at. Here are some real life photos for y'all to see some of the things that we purchase for our youth to have them move in. Um, these participants went from being homeless to homed in our 12 month program. Here are some of our youth that have moved in to our program. And yeah, any questions about pond housing before I get into workforce? Well, I just got to say, like, those pictures are really, again, I'm a little bit verklempt. You know, <laughs> I think of, I think of some of the students that I've had throughout my years, um, you know, who were not um, just loved for themselves and, and the things that they had to have gone through. I even Absolutely. know some students who who went through, uh, who got some help from one in 10. So like just thinking about what a big deal it is and how daunting it is. I mean, I think the first apartment that I ever rented in Phoenix was like seriously a two bedroom for $500 a month, right on the ASU campus, which is insane these days, right? Because that yeah. apartment is probably like two Rent right now for a one bedroom, for a studio one bedroom, we have at cost, we have to keep our youth at 1400. And, and so that, that in and of itself is like daunting, you know, your family has basically shunned you and said, you know, you're, you're dead to us or whatever. And somehow you managed to find this wonderful community in one in 10 who are willing to help you because those things are freaking scary in Absolutely. the best of time. And to think about doing it now as a youth, um, I mean, I would, it, there's, it's no wonder that so many of our, uh, of us Gen Xers, you know, have more and more of our children living with us because the Gen Z and millennials just, they can't afford anything. Right. So, and then when you, you pile on top of that, just discrimination and alienation of your entire support network. And I mean, like, and I think too, honestly, and I'm not, not going to try to disparage the Mormons here, but like, I know a lot, I've known a lot of Mormon youth who benefited from this massive Mormon kind of like safety net. But man, if you come out to some families, not to all, because there are some really loving Mormon families out there, but if you come out to some of these Mormon families, you're dead to them. And I right. can't imagine, and, and you think about Mormon families, they're really large. And so all your siblings gone, you know? Um, so this is, it's, it's just really touching the work that you do and I'm not going to stop you anymore. <laughs> No, you're fine. So I'm glad that you just touched on that because last yesterday 
once a month we have all our pond participants come into what's called a dinner and discussion and it's an opportunity for all our pond participants just to be in the same room and look around and be like wow like i'm not alone in this there are other individuals that are in this program and that i can connect with and we have something in common we were once homeless youth and just sitting around the dinner table last night with at least seven that came it's like y'all were once homeless and you all have homes right now and we're all sitting here as a family and it just it just brings so much light and so much like hope for those they were once in a struggling situation and they have been able to climb their way out and be able to be themselves and keep doing what they're doing so you want to probably ask yourself, well, how are these youth going to pay for their apartment? Well, funny that you asked that because my other partnership of my job is workforce and we run what's called queer career. Um, it is a six week program that my uh, co worker Isabel runs. Um, obviously, this is an old poster, um, but we're going to start our next one next week, Thursday. It is a six six week course. Uh, we meet every Thursday for two hours from four to six. Um, essentially, what we're going to work on is we're going to work on how to job search, how to build a resume, how to what are what are those appropriate things that can be asked in an interview? What are some embraceive things that they can ask you? Um, what are some things that we consider youth up for success? What jobs are actually hiring that you know will allow you to be your authentic self? Allow you to use the pronouns that you. Are, would like to to use, um, making sure that these jobs are safe for our individuals to go to every day. Um, we want to make sure that their understanding of financial literacy. Um, you know, how do they open a bank account? How do they budget? You know, we have um, meet the employers come in where we'll have at least six to eight employers come in for a, just like a mini workshop where youth are able to come in and meet the employer and ask questions that they would ask in an interview and just get you know some readiness skills and prompts and um, find out what places are hiring. So I'm glad that we have that as well because I encourage a lot of our pond youth to reach out to ESA and be able to get those jobs and who are who's hiring because how are you gonna pay for your bills if you're not working? Now, is this only open to the the youth that are involved in the PON program? It is not. Oh, anyone, anyone that is 16 to 24, because it's different, this is 16 to 24, is more than welcome to be part of Queer Queer. Um, they can also come in. We have drop-in programs um, at least once or twice a month for those folks that don't have the capacity to do a six week course, they can still are encouraged to come in, meet with ESA, um, discuss anything as far as budgeting or you know financial literacy, or even just working on interview skills and, and a resume. That's good, that's fantastic. She, do, she does one-on-ones with them too. So if that's something that you need, um, we also are going to, in the future, um, look more into a TIP program that's through Southwest Behavioral Health. Um, they do the same thing where they work with youth um, as far as prepping them with interview skills, um, budgeting. Um, they do more of like the life skills too, as far as, do you know how to clean your house? Do you know how to do laundry? Do you know how to cook? Do you know how to take care of your space? Um, making sure that your space isn't cluttered. I mean, we have a lot of, uh, like you said earlier, our newer generation has a lot of neurodivergent uh, identities, and we want to make sure that they're taking care of their space and not feeling overwhelmed themselves. So I, this, I have a question that's coming from a more political place right now, and I, it's clear that you're more on the programmatic uh, end of things, and, and you might not have an answer for this, but like, I just watched a board meeting, um, a school board meeting in Paradise Valley, and thankfully they have a majority a say, of sane public, pro public school people on their board, and there's one extremist. But but they're but they're different districts that have the extremists in the majority, and so like typically school board or school districts have partnered with Southwest Behavioral Health, 
with Jewish Community Family Services or whatever their name is, right? Like these groups who do the mental health care that that we as schools and school districts don't have the capacity to be able to handle. And it's a routine thing where we're like, okay, since we can't do that work, but we're mandated reporters, we're going to go ahead and partner with these groups because they know what they're doing. And then we can, you know, get the families to those appropriate uh, the, the, like networks of people. Um, so like, are you concerned about, so I actually watched a board member in Paradise Valley vote against a partnership with Southwest Behavioral Health because the organization talks about DEI and social emotional learning and things like that. Like, so are you all concerned that that's going to be something where, or, and how, I don't know, I don't know even so, know what the question is. I'm glad that you asked that because we definitely don't just pick individuals. We have, we dive in and we make sure that these individuals are going to be supportive to make sure that they're not going to um, derail anything that we've talked to these individuals about. Um, our deputy director actually made his own Excel spreadsheet for our trans and non-binary folks. So that way, when we're trying to navigate these youth, we're not just picking from the yellow pages as far as, oh, this would be a great place for you to go to get support. We want to make sure that we're setting these youth up for success. And of course, we're going to do the extra work to make sure that these places are safe before we do send them. And I mean, these like these are trusted, accredited organizations, but more and more, we're seeing people who are like, right. no. We don't yeah. want our kids to have mental health. I mean, like, and I literally feel like their reasoning for it, because I've heard this more and more too. Oh, well, if you're autistic, that means you have demons. Uh, if you have mental health issues, you have demons. You just need to go to church. Like, right. That's really and that, that, is, that is a barrier that we do, but it's understanding, like, you know, we can't go through our own past experiences. We have to put ourselves and really dive into empathy and really understand where, where these youth are coming from. I mean, we went to high school and I'm sure we thought it was a terrible experience. Can you imagine what they're going through today as far as technology goes, as far as, you know, everything they're seeing on the news? There were individuals at camp that were just breaking down because they're so scared to go to high school. And it's like, I can't imagine putting myself in their shoes and understanding what they're going through emotionally. But yes, we want to make sure that we're giving them the services that they need and we are not equipped for that so we have to outreach and we have to find places that are going to be more accepting for them to give them that medical side that we can't give them we're we're not, we're not therapists here we're not uh, we're not equipped to do you know we're not doctors so we have to make sure that we find those places for these youth to go to that are going to be accepting are going to be loving are going to be more willing to support someone in their needs and not derail them and bring them down because they're already understanding and going through so much trauma as it is at their age. We want to make sure we're setting them up for success. I have one more question here for now and that because I want you to keep going. Um, but Mary says transportation is an issue question mark. Do these housing partners ensure that apartments are on mass transit lines? So that is something that we highly encourage with our youth when they are apartment searching. Um, some of our youth actually do come in with cars. They have been living and sleeping in their car. Um, we do provide everyone in our pond program a 31 day bus pass while they are in our care. Um, we also have other individuals that we use in the community um, that provide transportation because yes, transportation is a big barrier. We are still working with other individuals to see um, as far as setting up better transportation for these youth. So that way they do have a place as far as going to and from work, going to and from doctor's office, making sure that those that need the extra support right now where they get back on their feet with government assistance, making sure they get to their appointments to DES or, or other um, program therapy, for instance, I mean, making sure that, yeah, making sure they have that transportation because transportation is the biggest barrier. All right. I'm going to stop interrupting you now. No, you're totally fine. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> All right. As far as other groups we have here at one in 10, we have our transgender non-conforming group. Um, it's peer support group that covers a range of biweekly topics based on feedback by trusted adults and lived experience. Um, essentially, 
it's a good space for those that do identify as trans and non-binary to be in a space with other trans and non-binary youth. So that way they have they have questions, comments, or concerns, they can lean on each other for support. And it's honestly one of our biggest programs that here, here at One in 10. Um, we also have our Together in Color. It's a space for queer youth of color to gather as a community to build and grow and thrive together. Um, like I said earlier, we do have a retreat for that as well. This is a program that has been amazing the past year and a half. D, the program specialist for this is great. They are so knowledgeable and they have been teaching youth on BIPOC history and they are just so excited to share more and more and more. So if you know any youth that are 11 to 24 that need some more support, um, especially for our BIPOC youth, please invite them to one in 10 so that way they can be in a space so they can thrive with other youth. Um, we also have the zone, which is for our males that are 14 to 24, we make a space for them um, to make sure that they are understanding, you know, it is okay to be yourself. It's okay to communicate and we got to end the stigma. Um, we do a lot of testing. We do a lot of uh, collab with um, Southwest HIV and AIDS. We do a lot of collabs with Taros. Um, we just want to make sure that our youth are safe and make sure that they're set up for success as well. Um, we also have a wellness specialist here. Um, our wellness individual works with our youth to make sure that they are working on their mental health, making sure that they are taking care of their bodies, taking care of their mind, taking care of their soul. Um, we do once a month, every first Friday, we do what's called Sex FYI, and we basically teach youth as far as you know, navigating dating, relationships, consent, physical and romantic attraction. And we kind of tie it into First Friday because it's nice for our youth to not only to come in, learn about these, these, uh, these topics, but then to be able to go out and look at other entrepreneurship um, at First Friday. And it's an opportunity for them to just kind of get out and you know, hang out and be themselves, be out and about and enjoy First Friday. Um, we have more um, as far as our sources of strength. Um, we work with them to, you know, obviously have a better mental health, educating them as far as skill building them, um, making sure that their mindfulness and their movement, you got to make sure that they're working on their wellness, their breathing. That is one thing we like to teach our youth is like smell your cake and blow out your candles. Um, and then nutrition making sure that they're getting adequate meals. And that's something too with our, our pond participants. We wanna make sure that living on your own, making sure that you're understanding how to grocery shop, what are some foods to grocery shop for, letting them know they don't have to go grocery shopping for a whole month. They could go for just a week um, because that's how things do go bad and spoil because they're buying these products and they're not being used. And lastly, we have our digital programs. For those that are unable to come to our center, uh, we have a Discord forum that we use that is open Monday through Friday from two to seven. Uh, we also stream on Twitch. Um, we also have our leadership development where we have our out scouts. Um, we have our counselors and training. Um, they are more for our youth that are more experienced with going to camp outdoors. We call them trail guides and they just navigate the youth through the camp experience as being like a mentor. Uh, we have Youth Advisory Council where youth are leaders of all the programs and our satellites. Um, they develop leadership skills and communication skills, public speaking skills, um, advise on programs and other issues affecting our organizations um, and then presenting it to our staff and our board of directors. And before I had chatted about our parents group that Gina runs, this was something that we thought was needed as far as the parents that need more direction on their youth may coming out. Um, it's gonna help them as far as navigate through other parents or other communications or just getting extra support. Um, they meet every first Thursday of the month from 6.30 to 7.30 and it is virtual. These are our contact informations and yeah, 
that is about it. It's one in 10 as a whole. Oh my gosh. I just love this organization so much. Um, Y'all do so much and have been doing so much for so long. And I love the fact that you have just this incredible growth model, you know, where you have every intention of expanding and making sure that all of our LGBTQ youth are so safe and cared for. Um, I do have one comment here from Annika. Uh, Annika says, so many homeless youth turn to prostitution, survival sex, or get trafficked. What are you doing to teach these youths harm reduction regarding both safe sex and the drugs they may use to cope? I remember talking with teenage prostitutes when I was a sex worker in my 20s and being heartbroken about how little sex ed, safe sex knowledge they had. They didn't even have the knowledge to guard their health while engaging in that work. So um, let's go back to what the question is. I guess, you know, what is it? What kind of uh, education or information do you give these kids uh, to reduce harm? So that's a great question. And what we do is that's the reason why we have our wellness specialist as far as the zone. Now I know the zone is just for young men of color, but we also like to make sure that our youth are safe. So that's why we have that first Friday where we have sex FYI, making sure that these youth are set up for success, making sure that the questions they have can definitely be answered for them. Um, Gina Reed, who I had said earlier is our program uh, manager, she actually went to ASU and took about 40 credits on uh, sex trafficking to make sure that she is educated enough to those youth that do come to us that are considered sex traffickers to make sure that they are getting the support they need to make sure that they get off the street and into a safe place so that way they don't have to do this anymore. And if anybody's interested, there's a really great documentary on right now, HBO, but now it's called Max, uh, called The yeah. School, that gives a history of sex work uh, amongst trans individuals, specifically in New York City during, I guess, right. like 80s, 90s, 2000s. Um, but it, it, you know, it kind of did that, that film brings a deeper understanding of why people turn to this work. I mean, why do you turn to this work? Why? They're probably, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a sex positive feminist, right? And, and so I believe that sex work is work. Um, but I also know that there are certain instances where that work is not something that the the individual finds empowering or wants to do in any way. Um, so the fact that the, it's just a really good film and I highly recommend it. Absolutely. Um, and you've got some kudos coming in here too. Ken, <laughs> Ken says, great program and great presentation. Thank you. I kind of wish something like this had been around 50 years ago. No, kidding. that is what a lot of individuals say. They really wish that our space was around when they were a youth because they could have really used that, which I completely agree. I, I wish the space was around too. I wish the space was in like every state, not just here, or especially for those that are like in Tucson, like having a space out there for them to be able to have a space where they can feel, they can go to feel loved, safe. And just to kind of go back what you said earlier about, you know, the sex trafficking, those individuals that I do identify as LGBTQ plus, they don't know what it's like to feel loved. They don't know what it's like to, you know, feel like they have a voice because it's been shut down by so many individuals in their lives that they don't know what it's like to to be, live every single day and they just feel like that's that's just their norm. Yeah, I mean, I I many of my friends who are members of the LGBTQ community um and who are Gen Xers like me or boomers um they were in that situation. So many of my friends uh in the LGBTQ community found themselves kicked out of their homes <laughs> way before yeah. they were 18. Um, and so it's just such great work. I just, I, and again, I wish that there, you know, like what do the kids in Yavapai County do or Graham right. County or Cochise for crying out loud, at least they right. got be in Cochise County, but you know, it's, it's just such a, a huge endeavor, but I do, like I said, I wanted to, your growth model, when I met with Nate, uh, a couple of years ago, we talked about it. I was just so impressed by how his vision was to really expand this kind of programming and these kinds of opportunities for kids um, who are experiencing this kind of stuff all throughout the state and every deep, door, dark evangelical corner of the state, <laughs> they're going to make <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, um, 
So let's see. This has been probably one, and, and it's it's an it's kind of a negative subject that we even need this kind of stuff. But it's so positive because of the work that y'all are doing. Like normally on Fridays, we talk to a lot of experts about you know white Christian nationalism and how it's <laughs> in America. And, and yes, it is, and that is a reason why your organization exists. But your you, this talk today really really gave me hope. So I'd love to hear since you're fresh off of a uh, you know a youth camp. What was, what, tell me what was one of the best things, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, I couldn't, no, you're to fine, present, but what's one of the best things that happened at your most recent summer camp with one in 10 that just made you feel like, okay, this is, this is it, this is the work that I'm doing, and I couldn't be more proud. So it's really going to make me emotional, but we do what's called the closing circle on our last day, and on our last day, we go to the cafeteria, we all close our eyes, and it's all a very anonymous, and each cabin gets up one-on-one, -on -one and they ask questions as far as who's touched you this week as far as, um, I probably shouldn't say something like that, but like touched us as far as um, who's made you feel the safest, or uh, who's made you feel like you can be yourself and who who's made you feel like, you know, you can be anything you want to be, who's made you feel like you uh, have a safe space and just getting all those hands on your back being touched is it's so overwhelming because it's like you made an impact you did that like you made the safe space for this youth and even though this youth it's only for a week you made such an impact this last week on them that they're going to go home they're going to remember this forever oh yeah well, that's amazing and when yeah. I you know like so like I said I did those leadership camps and it was such a great experience for me and the kids and those kids are, I mean like I've, you know, I've, I've had an effect or I've, I've had relationships with kids now for the past, it's almost 15 years. I haven't been in the classroom for a minute, but um, in that time, you know, I've watched them grow up and, um, you know, we're Facebook friends or Instagram friends and they'll, you know, reach out to me and be like, Hey, Miss Castine, guess what? I'm having a baby or Hey, Miss Castine, guess what? I just graduated or, you know, it was my favorite when I went to Rainbows Festival and, you know, I saw like three of my former students and they're like, guess what? You know, like I'm gay. And I was like, I know. <laughs> You're and like, I'm, and I'm here for you. I support you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's, there's nothing more special than that. Like those relationships last forever and you do make a long-term impact on those kids and not just them, but their kids and the kids that come out. Absolutely. Them. And we've I, had, we have had youth come back that have kids that have brought their kids here. So they're like, we had such an amazing time when we were a youth. I want my kids to experience this as well. Oh gosh. Second generation even. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, well, I really appreciate you having me here today and I'm glad everyone asked their questions. I did put the housing application in the um, chat as well as our pond wish list. Okay, yeah, and we'll have to try to make sure, you know, Lindsay, at some point, we'll try to make sure that we put those onto the, the Facebook page too, so people can see it or on the YouTube, so, the, the, so those resources are there because this webinar is a little bit more limited, but right. Carrie, I just, I really appreciate you because like I said, usually on Fridays, it's doom and gloom. <laughs> And this, this gave me hope and seeing pictures of those kids getting the keys to their first apartment. Oh my God. It's the best. It is the best. Huge, huge. All right. Well, I hope that everybody takes this positivity um, and just blast it out over the weekend. And Absolutely. Into the because this is a great organization. Lindsay has provided all kinds of ways for y'all to support. I saw Sandra said that she had some housewares that she wants to donate. So awesome. We'll definitely take it. <laughs> there's, there's links everywhere. So you we're a nonprofit. <laughs> right? and, and you know what? It's not a church. Not that there's any problem with churches. But there are other nonprofit groups in this world who are doing the same work. And we need to highlight the work that y'all do because you're not going to try to, you know, proselytize to anybody or convert them. You're just going to love them as they Absolutely. come to you. Absolutely. Oh, you made my right. whole Friday, Carrie. Thank you so much. You're everybody. so welcome. Thank you, everyone, so much. Have a wonderful day. Yep. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.